Hi, Greg Perry, the antiquarian horologist. Uh, welcome back to the conservation studio. So we're looking at a, uh, a dial here with a name on it this time, and uh, Batty Star in Beverly. I don't know. Um, it could be a, it could be a made up name. We don't know. Uh, but remember, early back on, probably around 1710, 1720, interior designers started selling clocks. They started selling clocks and furniture. They started rep, almost being like a manufacturer's rep for uh, clock makers. And, and, and remember, at one point in that first to second quarter of the 18th century, you had around 300 active tall case clock makers in London alone, primarily based in Clerkenwell. And uh, so you, uh, you had designers and you know, uh, fashion type people jump on this. And at that point is where clocks tall clock cases started to becoming a suite of furniture. In the beginning, they were their own entity, uh, whatever they may have looked like. But by then, designers drove the builders of the clock cases and furniture to create suites of the same furniture. And remember, uh, on, on the topic of furniture, they, they actually pushed and plummeted everything from a wig stand to a, a stand for a wash stand, for a bowl, for this or that. They created pieces of furniture that never existed before just to make a dollar. And this is case in point. So non-existent maker, Batty Star, it was a name. They put a name on the clock and they put it in their showroom. And maybe they had 22 different clocks and there were 22 different names. And maybe that was a catchy name in 1723 or whenever this clock was made or the 1770s, who knows? But nevertheless, but no, but this clock dates in the 1770s, there, there's no doubt. And we're going to date that clock because we're running into some really bad spandles, whether these are replacements or not. And you can look and, I mean, it is just, it, it's a mix mash of uh, acanthus leaves and scrolls and things like that. But it's almost too detailed and and, uh, and it just doesn't have the, the, the typical 18th century look that we're accustomed to. And sometimes... This, uh, this spandle is actually almost running too high up. Uh, we don't like to see them quite that high, probably backing down about a half inch, leaving more of a gap. And remember, at times, um, for the better clock dials, the brass dials, we would have had engraving going around the outside perimeter, almost like an outline around the entire dial face. So this dial probably hasn't been, uh, probably hasn't been, re or the chapter ring probably hasn't resilvered probably in about 20, 25, 30 years. And you can see the silvering is oxidizing here, but nevertheless, it still has somewhat of a nice look. The, uh, you know, the engravings are still filled with, with, with black wax, uh, shellac mixture, uh, looking fairly good. I mean, we all don't want everything to be brand spanking new looking. Uh, again, we like, we like to examine the, the aperture of the date. This is kind of cool, some are square, some are rectangular. And this one has a kind of a sag at the top. So it's a nice little addition. And we have our boss here added. And as we've talked about in the past, you know, here's the, these, you know, these new, new ornamentation to help try to continue selling clocks as clocks were, you know, kind of becoming out of fashion. So they're trying to get their mileage out of clocks. So they put a little sun, a star or something around the center arbor of the second spit. And, and they're making this bigger, the seconds area bigger. So anyway, anything to captivate you. And as again, we've seen in the past, we have a strike silent in the arch. And we have a really cool, look at this zigzag hand. These hands in the period, in this period, were all cut out by jeweler's salt. And they're put on a square shaft. And then a tapered hole is drilled through the shaft with a taper, tapered pin. And that's what secures it on there. So uh, kind of a cool thing, nice looking hand. But, uh, you know, typically um, a lot of these hands, which some of us deem original, they don't all match. I mean, they could have they bought this hand from one manufacturer. Remember, um, all the, the industry back then was, you know, done in the home. So one, one fellow, one artisan, one craftsman, one journeyman could have made just this hand. And maybe the, the one typical that this clockmaker or whoever put this clock together Maybe the other guy was out of him, so he goes to the guy next door and he, he gets a hand and puts it on. Maybe that's why this does not match the seconds bit or these hands. Who knows? They could have been replaced. But, you know, we, we work in a world as craftsmen and artists, clockmakers now. We understand this stuff. And, and I'm sure some of my colleagues will say, well, yeah, I, I don't think my, my, my client's going to matter if the hands don't match. It's kind of a cool hand. So, yeah, you're right. Some of them don't matter. But then some of them are very, the, the term we use, are very anal. They're very uh, detailed and they say, oh my God, everything has to match perfectly. So 
you know, so everybody's different. But again, back to that idea of a suite, a suite where all the hands have to match. That's, that's where we're going with this. So let's come over here and take a quick look from the side view. Um, I don't know if we can get up here at the top. I'm going to come around another clock here, but just take a look. This is, this is again, uh, controlling the, uh, the silent strike. So what did they do? They took a defunct wheel that wasn't, didn't have its teeth cut in it, kind of cut it in half, and that's, and they're pivoting right here, and they're using that as a, the silent strike shutoff. And this lever, when you turn it, hits that, turns it off. How cool is that? So again, we're back again to economy of stuff, trying to reduce our cost because the sale of clocks is going down. And again, another little piece of wheel work here um, to guide the, uh, the, the calendar, the calendar ring with, with the engraved numerals on it. And again, we've talked in the past, we have a ring with scratches on the back of the dial. That's, they're laying it out to see how it looks on the back before they actually put engraver to the front of the dial. Uh, typical stuff here, typical bell, Birmingham bell. So these things were pumped out generically, as we said in the past. In 1656, the Worshipful com Company of Clockmakers, all the, the great powers that be sat down and made standards for these clock movements to standardize them again, that all components throughout the, Isle of, the Isles of England all fit each other, by and large, the standard ones. And uh, so anyway, so we, I think we have a good bell, we have a good sound here. And it rings on and on. That's what you're looking for uh, in, a, in a good bell metallurgy. So, uh, Greg Perry signing off. Uh, thanks everyone for viewing.